channel, our new channel, with our friend Britton. And we are here at the Starved Rock National Park. And Britton has found a location, well, it's kind of a known location, infamous location, of where three women were murdered back in this park. It was December 1960. March. So, in, oh, it was March? Okay. So it was still, yeah, it was still winter. That's definitely winter here. So if you could imagine, there's a lot of snow here. It's just a beautiful, a lot of cliffs and dells, right? You call them dells in here. So we're, some canyons. Yeah. So we're going to walk a trail. Tommy the cat's here. Hopefully, here's the thing. Hopefully we keep a signal. We have two bars here in the canyon. How you doing, Tommy, Jane, Trish? All right. We got, uh, we got some friends coming here. Kathy Myers is here. How you doing? So this is our first live stream. What do you think, guys? This is our first one. So uh, we picked a location where we are going to come back and we're going to do some paranormal research here. But we thought we'd scout it out and we, we're scouting it out today. We thought we'd bring you along. We thought we'd just do it as part of a live stream. Now, Britain's really familiar with the story, so I'm going to let him do more of the talking today. But looks like we've got a great gang, almost 100 people already. Pretty cool. Hey, Melanie. Russ from Michigan. We got Landa Kane. We got UK here. Awesome. How are you guys doing from the UK, New Jersey? And we've got a lot of hikers on this trail today. Of course, it's Sunday. It's beautiful weather in Illinois. So we're going to see a lot of people, but I think it's good because it's going to give scale to this, this amazing cliff uh, canyon that we're going to see where this cave is. We're gonna, uh, we have a lot of human scale figures here, so it'll be pretty cool. We don't have to use Britain, send him up the cliff. <laughs> I'll go. But it's crowded out here. Well, what do you expect? It's like 70 degrees, sunny, yeah. October, Halloween a week away. All right, let's get a walking. Hello from Lawrence, Kansas. How's it going? All right, Britton, I'm going to follow you. Let's, let's actually go that way. We are going to go down the trail. Yeah, this is beautiful in here. Tammy Mullins, guess what? $2, thank you. You are the, go ahead, Britton. You are the first contributor on a live stream on Intangible Quests. How about that? Yay, Tammy. Thank you. Yay, Tammy. All right, let's walk very carefully. We're coming to the trail that splits off to go to this infamous location. And you got to be really careful watching your step here. It is going straight down, man. Look at that. What are you thinking? rambling off about the history of the park here first. Yeah, why don't you tell us, uh, this has a lot of First Nation Native American history here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? We'll stand here and enjoy the view for a minute while you tell us. Starved Rock State Park, uh, recognized as the first state park in the state of Illinois. Um, I believe 1908 was given the, uh, was given to the state national grounds and then in the 1930s. I don't know if you can hear us guys, we got a lot of wind. Uh, 1930s it was, uh, the lodge was built and uh, 2,600 acres of land make up what the uh, Starved Rock State Park is. Now the first inhabitants of this area honestly that give it recognition goes back to 1683, uh, French pioneers built a fort on the uh, on the embodiment that is known as Starved Rock. It's technically a great big bluff. Uh, all of these bluffs and canyons were created about 20,000 to 15,000 years ago. Scientists estimate it was something called the Kankakee Glacier. Uh, might be incorrect with that, but yeah, glacier melted, formed all this land here 20,000 some years ago. But we go back to 1680s. The French pioneers built a fortress on top of what the Starved Rock is known today. Um, 40, 40 years or so, the French held down that fort. Uh, you have the 1760s, 
Now the natives have moved back in and you have tribes that were more from the north came down and settled at this time. The legend of Starved Rock goes as such. There was a confederation of Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Ottawa Indians that were trying to make peace or some type of treaty with the Illinois, Illiniwek. Um, during one evening, the chief of the Ottawa named Chief Pontiac was assassinated by an Illini brave. Uh, from that point, it becomes war. You have a band of Illini braves that were trapped at the base of what the Starved Rock is. And for a two year time period, the Potawatomis and the Ottawas had the entire rock surrounded. Anything, any braves that came off of the rock uh, were killed in the surrounding forests. And those braves eventually starved to death on what the starved rock is, surrounded by all of their enemies. Um, now we fast forward to the 1900s. This became a very popular scenic scenic route for, well, there was actually four different paths, hiking trails from the original lodge grounds that went either directions, two west, two east. Uh, they both lead into very nice vistas and canyons. Um, at this point, we have to jump to the afternoon of... Okay. Lots of beautiful dogs. Beautiful people, beautiful dogs. Anyways, the fateful afternoon, March 14th, 1960. Uh, three women from Riverside, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Uh, Miss Mildred Lindquist, age 50 years old. Mildred Lindquist, 50 years old. And who else did we have? Uh, Lillian Oatler, 50 years old. Okay. Francis Murphy, 47 years old. So 47, 50, and 50? Yeah. Okay. Why don't we... Uh, all right, guys, we're going to slide on our butts, if you're me. We're going to go down this. Yeah, there's no waterfall, waterfall here. All yeah. right, I'll follow you, buddy. Well, the waterfall's dry. That's what up, I always say. There is a waterfall. We're That's what I'll say. That. It's like, hey, Britain, take the lead. I'll follow you. Yeah. You want me to go first? No. All Just right. Just in case here. Uh, this trail that we're jumping off of, this takes you to the top of what the canyon is, the St. Louis Canyon, it is known as. This trail we're about to jump on actually takes us right into the mouth of uh, to the cool. canyon and the cave. All right. It's a little loose right here. here on that branch. Just ah, we're fine. Yep, we're good. Cool. All right, so the three women, they come here with the sole purpose of taking pictures of birds. They were all avid bird watchers, uh, pretty prominent families they had left behind in Riverside. Uh, three husbands who were all CEOs and managers, presidents of the companies that they worked for. So uh, let me set the stage here. So for those of you just joining us, we're at Starved Rock National Park on this beautiful week before Halloween, eight days before Halloween. And we're here because for this channel, because there were three infamous murders committed, bodies dumped here in 1960 in March. And we're gonna be coming back here to do some paranormal investigation at some point. We have some methods we're going to employ but we wanted to scout it out first, so we thought we would take you guys along. So Britt has actually just told some of the history of what's here from the First Nation Native American history. Don't go backwards, whatever you do. Oh boy. And he's telling us the story of the, uh, the murder. So again, we had three women, 50, 50, 47 years old. It's March, they're bird watchers, they're taking pictures and somehow they make it. Now we're on the far western end of the park and you think that they probably needed to get a ride to get here? Like, yeah. so, like to walk here is a long ways from the center. From the lodge. From the lodge, yeah. And they pulled up to the lodge uh, in their station wagon, unloaded all their luggage into two different uh, rooms at the lodge. Uh, that's the last time they were seen alive leaving the lodge. We okay. have one theory that speculates they were actually brought out here by potentially one of the suspects just because it is such a uh, such 
such a long walk, I guess. One of the one of the victims had an ailment. I don't know if it was a foot or a hip or something like that. But yeah, there's good theories and good evidence that maybe they were driven out here from the lodge, which is about a mile, about one click east from where we mile are Mile east, okay. Um, you have the thaw, you know, the middle of March to the middle of April is what's known as the thaw here in the Midwest. Um, when they arrive here that weekend, there is still snow covering the ground. Uh, not too much snow, about one to two inches of snow. Uh, all of the ravines and waterfalls. Hold on, let's let these people pass. Yeah, we got lots of foot traffic here. We got Dave, a so lot we just gotta of people kinda here. This is a big reason why, why we're going go to, uh, we're gonna come back in a few months when it's just not so lively. Yeah, yeah, when we do our research, it will be probably in the winter. And like I mentioned, this is really nice, uh, really nice weather. Probably the last nice weekend we're gonna have here for another six months and people are trying to get it in here. Everybody's, this is great though, having all the people here because you can really, let me get on this side. So you can really get a feel for kind of the scale of this. We're gonna end up in this canyon that's really cool. And you're gonna see these, you're gonna see the cave where these women's bodies were put. But anyway, uh, so as you were telling us the story, Britton, uh, during the thaw. They're here during the th uh, thaw? Yeah. Which is, well, March is kind of still really cold here. Go yeah. ahead. But you do start to, they're here to take you, pictures you get, of birds. We call it Indian summer sometimes. We get those really warm days. And yeah. again, we're not, you know, First Nation, we know. But that's what they called it back then. That's Indian technically summer. what this is, this heat wave that we're getting right before the uh, cold comes in. For yeah. Here, we call it Indian summer. Yeah. Um, Back so any the, so anyway, they're they're back here. They they make their way. They're here, and then what? They disappear, right? Yeah, yeah. They uh, two rolls of film, brand new camera. I can't think of what the name of C three or something like that was the name of the camera. Okay. It's pretty uh, pretty common at that time. Uh, so yeah, anyway, yeah. the the bodies. Then the, then the bodies were discovered by who? The next day? Uh, no. No, the women don't come back right. that night when their husbands are waiting for them to call home and check in. None of them get a call. Uh, Miss Murphy's husband in particular had a very bad feeling after he didn't hear from his wife. Uh, the, the night passes, they get to the next day. He calls the other two husbands who haven't heard from their wives. And from that point, Mr. Murphy contacts one of his friends with the Chicago Crime Commission, who gets in contact with the Illinois State Police, who get in contact with the local authorities here in LaSalle County. Uh, you have two days, uh, March 16th, 2000, or March 16th, 1960. Okay. Uh, you have just outside of the state park grounds, um, back then there was a home for delinquent children um, juvenile offenders, orphans, was not quite an orphanage, but two people from the center were actually the ones to come down here and discover the bodies. And they were, were they, were they hiking or what was going on? Well, they were searching for the bodies. Oh, they were searching. After okay. 48 hours had passed and the local authorities get involved, they create search parties going from either or direction from the lodge to try to find uh, try to find evidence of where they went off to. Okay. Uh, Bellhop had checked the rooms. They found that none of their luggage was opened up. The beds were not slept in. Um, their station wagon was still was still inside of the parking lot. You know, untouched. Uh, one thing that I left out: the night they disappeared, the 14th of March, there was heavy snowfall that evening. There was about six to eight inches of snow that came down that night, which uh, which kind of plays into this. Okay. Uh, you fast forward two days later, the 16th, and yes, two teenagers definitely. from the children from the uh, from the children's home. We'll just call it. Uh, they discover the bodies. They discover the treacherous mm. crime scene that it was. All right. So we're going to see that crime scene as we make our way down this trail to the. It's really a dead end. There's a lot of people there in the canyon, and we'll see the cave. And then there was a a dishwasher who worked at the lodge that came under suspicion. Yeah. Wetner, Wet, Wetner? Uh, what Chester Wager, W-E-G-E-R, Mr. Chester, Chester Wager. Yeah. 
that's a little bit ahead from this, though. You have now the bodies are discovered. Uh, they were beaten. They were bludgeoned to death. It was very bloody, very horrifying crime scene. Uh, their skulls were actually crushed in. Two of the women had their underwear and undergarment torn off and their jackets stuffed between their legs. Okay. And they Ooh. were all arranged in a fashion inside of the cave. All right. One thing very evident from the moment that they find the bodies is whoever committed this crime, this was a very violent, savage act. There had to have been all types of blood and remnants over where they were killed and where they were found in the cave. It just seemed that they had been dumped there. They had been dragged there. Uh, signs of sexual assault with their pants pulled off and whatnot. Um, Eight so it's definitely, of, definitely a sexual assault. Yeah. Okay. Eight inches of snow now. Uh, when your first wave of investigators come out, they bring with them flamethrowers to melt some of the snow to try to find some evidence. Um, all three of the women showed signs of being tied up and, and held, uh, you know, be, uh, held against their, against their will. Uh, one of the victims, it appeared as if she had broken out of her, uh, broken out of her binds. And they were tied up, as I recall, with twine. Yeah. A certain kind of twine. Uh, from that point, you know, they can gather as much evidence as they could from the scene. They find a log about the size of this guy right here. Thank I you, Larry. Say. Five bucks. Uh, the log, they find evidence of, you know, blood, skull, brain matter and they are able to link the tree log to the murders. As yeah, the murder weapon, yeah. murder weapon. Yeah. So he basically beat them senseless with the log. Or at least one of them. Now, from this point in March, the case grows cold. And the summer of 1960 comes along, which is a very hot summer on record here, Utica in LaSalle County. Um, at this point, you have the chief prosecutor, state's attorney from the county. Well, I can't think of his first name off the bat. His last name was, uh, I think his last name was Wallen. Anyways, this was an election year. And so this gentleman was trying to, before the end of the summer, find a suspect, solve the right, crime, you right. know, to boost him in the November elections. Right. During July of 1960, he comes back to the lodge right. and he asks questions from everyone. And they also start to have a bunch of staff and potential suspects take, um, take polygraphs. Uh, from there he learns <laughs> that yep. there is a ball of twine in the kitchen area of the lodge that matches the binds that the victims were wrapped up in. Uh, Where did it was find really that? the first step in the kitchen. In the kitchen of the lodge. Yeah. So that's how they kind of started zeroing in on this dishwasher guy, right? Yeah, then he also gets a report that this same dishwasher guy main suspect who ends up being Chester Wager uh, around the time of the murders had shown up to work it looked like he had been in a fight he had bruises and scratches on his face yep. you have multiple witnesses he worked with that testified to that here uh, stop here let's stop the story just for a second I want you guys to see we are just entering the canyon here look at that I hope I hope we have a clear picture but the cave is like right in there and you're gonna see it. But that goes up way up and it's like a bowl, uh, like a box canyon. Yeah, I'd say a good 60, 70 feet all the way up to the peak. Yeah, the I right think you're right. Side. And yeah. it's even higher up here on the left. Yeah, that trail oh, we, look at that. It goes way, way, it keeps going up. When we first started back there, the trail we jumped off of actually takes you up to that bluff. Now on the film reel from the woman, um, yep. That was another thing, too. It was very much staged to be like a sexual assault. Right. Uh, no evidence of real, true but, robbery. You know, I kind of got the feeling that it, they thought it was staged, but then it turned out that was 
the motive. Yeah. But, you know, here's the thing with this story. What half the people's, you know, there's so many different facets to it. Half the people think he's, I don't know about half, but a lot of locals think this guy's innocent. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of the story. You keep going. Yeah, there's a few little factors I think I left out, but we uh, no, we can pause right here for a bit, and I'll get more into. Uh, okay. We're still at July of 1960, so now they hear these reports that this dishwasher had bruises and scratches on him. You also get another witness testifying, stating that that man in particular, Chester, and one of his friends, who was another dishwasher. Uh, were seen with the three women before they embarked out on their hike. Right. Now, the information that I gathered, everyone from the lodge, which was up to 45 to 50 people, all voluntarily took their polygraphs. After the second polygraph that Chester Weger takes, his, his lie detector test is showing signs of deception. Uh, at that point, the technician conducting the polygraph tell the, tells, the techni tells the detectives, this is your guy, this is who to go for. So from that point, he is in the authorities' crosshairs at the end of July of 1960. Chester. Yeah, Chester Weger. 21-year-old uh, Chester Weger. Uh, March 3. And time out. So, guys, the picture is probably, I, I'm not sure we're like in the canyon now. So, I'm hoping, I hoping we get a, a decent signal, but it's going to get a little sketchy because we're like in the box canyon. So, if it's buffering, it's buffering. We're going to do the best we can. I just hope we don't lose the signal. All right. So, go ahead. Chester Weger becomes prime suspect number one. And he, um, He gets a cop, well, actually a crew of cops trailing after him. Uh, and this goes on all the way up until November of 1960. One month before the big election, state's attorney's really grinding away, trying to find some anything that he can go off of. Because up to this point, it's just been a lot of his, uh, a lot of his hunches that he's gone on to gather evidence. And, you know, from the clues that he found, especially with the ball of twine, it's taken him down roads, you know, which are leading to this suspect. Uh, so you have them hitting all kinds of dead ends up until they remember a report that had actually occurred in November of 1959. This would be six months before the uh, six months before the crime occurred. Uh, this police report that was made in November of 1959 states that there was a boyfriend and a girlfriend in a, another park that is actually unincorporated. It's called Matheson State Park. It's just across the river. It's less than a mile from where the lodge was, but just on the other side of the river, there were these two teenagers, boyfriend and girlfriend, out on their first date, and uh, they were robbed. They were robbed and tied up by a suspect. Uh, the woman was taken into the woods and raped. Uh, you know, back then, 1959, it's crazy to say it, but this was just kind of the police report was made out, then it was thrown onto a shelf where it was just kind of forgotten about until we get to a year later, November of 1960, and the state's attorney just gets a hunch, you know, maybe let's bring these two kids in for questioning, let's show them a list of suspects. So from a pile of Polaroids, the, they show the girl and the guy a picture of Chester Weger which she right away says that that's the man that's the man who raped me he uh he had a rifle he had a bullet in in between his teeth that he had in his mouth the whole time he robbed us and then took me off and raped me uh, the young man corroborated the story he also picked the face up out of a lineup uh not yet a live lineup but this was just a stack of suspect pictures and they both positively identify Chester Weger as the man who committed that crime that afternoon in 1959. <laughs> so now the authorities got something to go on. They can Wait, actually was grab 59? him. Wait, that was in 59? No, it was 60. Yeah. November of 59, he raped the girl and oh, robbed her boyfriend first. Oh, that's the earlier story. Gotcha. So we get into Mr. Chester Weger. Now they got reason enough to bring Don't him in. Don't question Britain. Who knows? <laughs> man, now they got enough to take him into custody and uh, pretty much grill him all they can. 
And from that point, after about 24 hours of him being in custody, they call the judge, they call a prosecutor, they call his parents in, and they get him to confess what actually became a nine-page confession. Also, at this point, they did a live lineup um, in which he was the youngest suspect. Now, for the people in his defense, this live lineup they did was, uh, it was tacky, to say the least. The four other gentlemen, four or five other gentlemen that were lined up with him in the police station were all middle-aged. He was the only young, you know, looking suspect. But of course, the, once again, after picking his face up from the stack of Polaroids, the two victims of the robbery rape point him out of the lineup and say, yeah, that's our man, that's our man right there. Uh, within 12 hours before the next morning, before the sun rises on the next morning, they've got a confession out of him, the two main detectives. Uh, Hess and uh, Dammit, maybe Dumet. This fellow's name was Hess and Dumet. They'll come into uh, their names come up, come up a lot during the uh, during the trial and whatnot. But these two are the main guys. Uh, one thing that I also forgot to mention: after the case went cold in March of 1960, the three husbands and the owner of the Starved Rock Lodge come together and raise up $35,000 as a reward for uh, anybody solving this case, any information that they can find. Okay, from this point, Chester gives a nine-page confession and actually elaborately goes into details that just, uh, you know, could not but have before, been made up or falsified. But before that, the, and the allegations came later that they, the guy threatened that he was going to go to the electric chair and... Supposedly, he said in actually an interview two years ago on the news that the guy had a gun on him. Said, "I'm just I, if you don't confess, I'm just going to kill you." So now we have that whole thing. Now, was he lying or not? We don't know, right? But, yeah. So, and you had his defense attorney during the trial really trying to go on any kind of branch to lean upon, and you know, the fact is, the judge, his parents, the prosecutor, were all present in the room when he gave this confession. They, uh, there were no signs of him being abused or beaten at all. Okay. The fact that he claims he was yeah. jabbed in his rib and this and that, there's just Good very chance much. Good he's lying, huh? Yeah. Yeah, lots of pros and cons to all that. Now you get to his confession, and a week later after he gives a nine-page confession, he, um, he takes the authorities out here to this actual spot where we're standing starts to go into detail about that afternoon what happened uh, in his confession he claimed that he saw the three women leaving the lodge as soon as they got out of earshot and were crossing one of the main bridges to get over to this area of the park that is when he kind of pounced them out and he started following them uh, you have i believe there was seven or eight pictures in the roll of film uh, when they find the bodies they also find the binoculars and they also find the camera still right. intact uh in one of those pictures in the camera it was triple exposed so you had for triple a while exposed. the authorities yeah john booware yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had a uh, from we rewinding the film maybe right yeah but you had uh you've got what could potentially be a suspect in the background of one of these photographs oh. that the authorities were trying to lean upon that evidence that kind of went nowhere Okay. But you just have pictures. So of just the like women. a blurry image. Yeah, from these pictures, from that roll of film, they could kind of trace the steps that they took that uh, that afternoon. So we go back to Chester and what he was saying. That, uh, okay. Yeah. A little windy in here, guys. Hopefully, you got a decent picture. It was just so much with his confession that just lined up with the facts. Um, so he sat in jail for. 60 years, yeah. up until two years ago, mm -hmm. March and of 2020. He finally got out on parole. And let's go look at the. Uh, this is the cave, guys, right here, where the bodies were left, right up here. So he dragged the three bodies up here. Did he drag them all the way up, or did they? Well, this is where you got conflicts with the story. You got people in his defense, family and friends.
claim that it was impossible, you know, for him. One thing, too, he was smaller in statue. He was technically about Thanks, Jacqueline, for four to five, five inches shorter than the shortest woman. Right. Uh, all of the women outweighed him. Um, you know, you just had you just had conflicting conflicting evidence with the fact that he was just a smaller guy. And how the heck did he get three bodies up here to this cave? Yeah, how could you they, get three bodies? Now you can climb up here. To drag three bodies up here by yourself, there's no way. So they probably weighed like 130, right? 150 pounds, maybe. One, transfer feet laying this way, uh, with her feet facing towards the back wall. Okay. And then you had two other women right here, uh, laying with their feet out in the open. Uh, their legs were spread. Like I mentioned before, there are I don't know if you guys, were, I know you can't hear, Britain's going to try and shout a little more. These were spread apart. Their undergarments were torn off. The pictures you see of the crime were like a setup, yeah. maybe. In between the legs, their jackets. A uh, really big bicycle that they found, too, with signs of The log with brakes. And the camera bag um, on the bridge. And his first intent, his only intent, was to rob them. And he ran past them and thought he was snagging one of the purses from off of their shoulder. It actually was the camera. It was the camera that he tore off of one of their necks, which lines up with the evidence that they find that day. The camera was, in fact, dented and busted up, and the one of the latches on it was broken off like okay. it had been torn off. Um, the authorities ask him, well, why is right here? And that reason he dragged them into the cave and staged it to make it look like a rape was because he was so seen. This right up here. That red. He said he killed them right up here, right? Yeah. Where those boulders are. And they asked him why he dragged them. Killed him to, uh, well, we got to remember. He was going to let them live, that he tied them up, and that he claims once he got halfway up that trail we just came from, one of the women had untied herself and ran up to him and gives. He then defends himself, he claims, and picks the nearest log. Uh, the woman who's scratching him, attacking him with binoculars, he then bludgeons her to death right there at that spot. Uh, when he gets back over here, he figures he's got to clean up the witnesses and do away with the other two. One thing he mentioned to the police, the reason why he dragged the bodies, is because he'd see a small passenger plane painted red and white going back and forth. Now, this is something that is just so damaging as far as evidence goes. He uh, point go to the nearest airfield and check the flight logs, and sure enough, there was an airplane painted white and red flying over that night. Yeah, but the way I see it, when I heard that, it's like a red and white plane flying over Utica in this whole area. I mean, everybody would see it, so. Just the fact that that, just the fact that, that is something only someone who was here and that after. Well, yeah, know. but I, th I believe that anyone in town, you had to be here, but here in Utica, not in the park. Yeah. Because I'm a pilot and, you know, flying, you, you know, to do a turn, a half mile, a mile turn is kind of oh, yeah. tight. Now, years later, during one of his appeals or whatever, that's something they brought up. That he claims, in fact, he was in the near town of Oglesby getting a haircut, right. trying to use an alibi. And he said from the town of Oglesby, that's when he saw the plane riding back. But according to okay. the 11 uh, or 12 individuals that were with him, the authorities so, that bring him out here to recreate the crime, he right. claims that he saw from overhead. Uh, one thing I got to mention, from the crime scene photographs from that day, the actual falls, which isn't really much trickling down now, but these yeah. falls get frozen. It was like a big icicle. icicle. All right, so we're going to wrap this story up here, guys. Um, but we're not going to wrap the live stream up. But uh, again, we're going to be coming back here for this channel to do some paranormal investigation because they were killed like right up, right up there. And, and we have a plan. So thanks for, glad you guys could come along here. Uh, just want to engage a little bit. How are you guys doing? Any questions for Britain or I on this story? Uh, one more kind of tidbit I have to throw in here. The irony coincidence of all this is this coming Friday, October the 28th, 
Hey, the man's already been paroled. He's, he's out of prison. You have an effort by these attorneys that he's hired to try to get him exonerated, to try to get the murder conviction thrown out, and then from there they can sue for wrongful imprisonment or something like that. You have just in a few days from now probably what the biggest breakthrough in this case is going to be since he was released. Right. And they're going on DNA evidence that they found in two of the victim's hands. They had handfuls, were two different sets of hair. And this can go on and on here, but from this point, gang, just kind of dig into more of these facts. There's yeah, so, much so more we're just come. kind of wrapping up the story here. Um, so anyway, we've got tonight at 8 p.m. a really cool story from Rhode Island. Hopefully see you guys on the Faces of the Forgotten channel. This channel, we're still ramping up. We are actually this week shooting a lot of episodes for this channel. So... We're going to probably have more content coming out in the next, I would say, two weeks. And you'll know, start to ramp it up. Face is forgotten. We'll still have. After Halloween, it's going to kind of go down uh, to maybe one or two a week. Because um, I can, you know, I wish I had a clone. <laughs> All right. So, um, great, guys. Any questions? Any Anything you want to find out more about this story or what's going on with the channels? going to wrap it up here but I wanted to engage a little bit and watch I'm watching the chat here Maynard says face of the forgotten rocks thank you that's very cool rock stop yep likes the story all right guys well I think we're going to wrap it up right here from this box canyon I'm so glad the signal worked out with Britton and I this is really fun and we're going to be back here everybody Enjoy your Sunday, and hopefully I see a lot of you guys tonight. Britt and I will Shout see you on Faces. Forest yeah, Forest Home Cemetery. I got a story for Forest Home for next time. So uh, we will uh, catch you guys soon and look for more content coming from this channel at Tangible.